Inhalational anesthetic agents are typically in liquid form at room temperature and pressure. To administer them, they must first be converted into a gas or vapor. This conversion process is called vaporization and the equipment that facilitates it is known as a vaporizer. The vaporizer ensures that the gas is mixed in the right concentration with oxygen or air keeping the patient safely anesthetized. In this video series, we will explore the physical principles behind vaporization, the working mechanisms of vaporizers and different types of vaporizer. Let's begin with the physical principles behind vaporization. Before discussing vaporizers, we first need to understand what a vapor is. To grasp this concept, it is essential to know about something called critical temperature. When a gas is compressed intensely, the particles that make up the gas are brought closer to each other. As you continue compressing, at some point, the particles will coalesce, turning the gas into a liquid. However, if the gas is above a certain temperature known as the critical temperature, no matter how much pressure is applied, the gas will not turn into a liquid. A substance that is below its critical temperature can exist in both its liquid and gaseous forms. The gaseous form of such a substance is called a vapor. If enough pressure is applied, this vapor will condense into a liquid. In contrast, a gas that is above its critical temperature remains in its gaseous form. No matter how much it is compressed, it will not condense into a liquid. Let us take isoflurane as an example. The critical temperature of isoflurane is about 200 degrees Celsius. Therefore, at room temperature around 21 degrees Celsius and atmospheric pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury, isoflurane exists as a liquid vapor phase. Now, imagine you are on the planet Venus. The surface temperature on Venus is about 500 degrees Celsius. Since the room temperature on Venus is higher than the critical temperature of isoflurane, isoflurane will be only in gaseous form. If all of this seems confusing, remember that at room temperature on Earth, the gaseous forms of common anesthetic agents exist in liquid vapor phase. For those interested in learning more about critical temperature and pressure, please visit my video on anesthesia gas supply systems. The link is provided below. When the anesthetic agent is placed in a tight container, the vapor molecules exert pressure on the walls of the container. This is called vapor pressure. Over time the pressure exerted by the vapor stops further liquid from vaporizing by compressing the vapor molecules back into liquid. At this point, the vapor is said to be saturated, meaning it cannot hold any more molecules and the system is in equilibrium. The pressure at this point is called saturated vapor pressure. SVP is important because it tells us how easily a substance can turn into vapor at a specific temperature. Each anesthetic agent has a unique SVP, so vaporizers need to accurately control the amount of vapor released based on the SVP of the agent at room temperature. SVP is influenced by two factors, the physical properties of the volatile agent and the surrounding temperature. As the temperature increases, more liquid molecules gain the energy to escape into the vapor phase, increasing the vapor pressure. When the saturated vapor pressure of a liquid equals the external atmospheric pressure, the liquid reaches its boiling point. At this point, all the liquid rapidly turns into gas throughout its entire volume. So if the agent has a lower boiling point, it can easily vaporize at a given temperature and atmospheric pressure, meaning that agents with lower boiling point have higher SVP. 
Another relationship we notice here is that atmospheric pressure has to be equal to the SVP to make the liquid agent boil. So if the atmospheric pressure is low as in high altitude, vapor pressure easily reaches the lower outside pressure, allowing the agents to boil sooner. So, we can deduce that the most volatile of the agents are those with the highest SVPs at room temperature. At any given temperature, these agents also have the lowest boiling points. You can check the table given in the earlier slide. For example desflurane boils at 22.9 degrees at an ambient pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury. This means it easily turns into vapor at room temperature, making it challenging to control its concentration during anesthesia. For this reason desflurane vaporizers have the mechanism to compensate for change in atmosphere. Modern vaporizers for most agents automatically adjust for altitude changes, ensuring safe dosing. Older vaporizers may require manual adjustments to ensure proper anesthetic delivery at higher elevations. The quantity of anesthetic vapor can be measured either by its absolute pressure in millimeters of mercury or kilopascals, or as a volume percent which represents the amount of vapor in relation to the total gas mixture. The pressure exerted by the vapor can be explained by Dalton's law of partial pressure which states that, in a mixture of gases, each gas exerts pressure independently of the others and the total pressure is the sum of the partial pressures of all the individual gases. Let's say a patient is breathing a gas mixture that contains 49% oxygen and 49% nitrous oxide with 2% of an anesthetic agent like sevoflurane. With the total pressure of the gas mixture at sea level of 760 mm of mercury, we can calculate the partial pressures of each component as follows. So the total pressure of 760 mm of mercury is the sum of the partial pressures of all these gases. These concentration are determined by gas analyzer in the anesthesia circuit and can also be ascertained from vaporizer dial. Now why is the partial pressure important? The partial pressure of the anesthetic agent determines its physiological effect as the agent's partial pressure drives its absorption into the bloodstream and tissues. And when we adjust the concentration on the vaporizer dial setting, we are indirectly adjusting the partial pressure of the anesthetic agent relative to the oxygen and other gases. Volume percent expresses the relative ratio or proportion of gas molecules in a mixture. The volume percent is a relative measure and doesn't change with pressure or temperature under normal conditions. For instance, if a gas mixture contains 2% sevoflurane, this means that 2% of the gas molecules in the mixture are sevoflurane molecules. As mentioned earlier, the concentration can be determined by setting on the vaporizer dial and also from the partial pressure measured using a gas analyzer. Expression of quantity of anesthetic gas in percentage is important because the vaporizer dial is set to deliver gas in proportion to oxygen air or nitrous oxide. Anesthesiologists often need to adjust the concentration of anesthetic gases delivered to the patient. Percentages are straightforward for setting and adjusting the concentrations on vaporizers. The minimum alveolar concentration that determines anesthetic potency is also expressed in volume percent. Expressing MAC in percent ensures that the value remains consistent regardless of changes in atmospheric pressure making it a reliable measure under different conditions. So it makes sense that anesthetics are delivered in percent though the action of it depends on the partial pressure. The minimum alveolar concentration is a measure of anesthetic agent potency. 
It is defined as the concentration that produces immobility in 50% of patients who undergo a standard surgical stimulus measured at sea level at 760 mm of mercury. MAC is expressed as volume percent of alveolar gas. Expressing MAC in percent ensures that the value remains consistent regardless of changes in atmospheric pressure. The MAC of different inhalational anesthetics are given here. A lower MAC value means that a smaller concentration of the anesthetic is needed to achieve the desired anesthetic effect. Thus, anesthetics with lower MAC values are considered more potent. At their SVP, most anesthetic agents are very potent. Let's take an example of sevoflurane, which has an SVP of approximately 160 mm of mercury at 20 degrees Celsius. Sevoflurane's MAC is about 2%, meaning it is potent enough to induce anesthesia at this low concentration in the alveoli. Now when sevoflurane is fully saturated at atmospheric pressure of 760 mm of mercury, the concentration would be around 21%. This is significantly higher than the 2% MAC value, implying that sevoflurane at its SVP is approximately 11 times more potent than the amount needed to achieve anesthesia in 50% of patients. Therefore, vapors must be diluted to provide clinically meaningful concentrations and the way this is done is by mixing oxygen and other gases. We have repeatedly stressed that partial pressure of the anesthetic in the central nervous system is responsible for the anesthetic effect. So one should also think of MAC in terms of partial pressure and not only volume percent. Terms like minimum alveolar pressure, minimum alveolar partial pressure and partial pressure at 1 MAC are used to describe the partial pressure of an anesthetic agent at a concentration of 1 MAC. For instance, 1 mac of isoflurane is equivalent to a PMAC1 of 8.7 mm of mercury. When administering inhalational anesthetics at different altitudes, it is crucial to consider how altitude affects the partial pressures of anesthetics. The partial pressure of inhalational anesthetics is the pressure exerted by the anesthetic gas within the mixture of gases in the lungs. It is calculated by multiplying the atmospheric pressure by the concentration of the anesthetic gas. For example, if a sevoflurane is administered at a 2% concentration, the partial pressure at sea level would be 15.2 mm of mercury. At 5,000 feet, the partial pressure would be 12.64 mm of mercury and at 10,000 feet, the partial pressure would equal 10.46 mm of mercury. The decrease in partial pressure of inhalational anesthetics at higher altitudes means that the anesthetic potency can be affected. To maintain the same anesthetic effect, at higher altitudes, a higher concentration of the anesthetic may be required to achieve the same partial pressure and clinical effect as at sea level. However modern vaporizers have a compensation mechanism to account for pressure changes. Vaporization is the process where molecules transition from the liquid phase to the vapor phase and this requires energy. This energy is known as the latent heat of vaporization. It is defined as the amount of heat needed to convert a unit mass of liquid into vapor. For instance, at 20 degrees Celsius the latent heat of vaporization for isoflurane is 41 calories per gram. The heat of vaporization is inversely related to the ambient temperature, meaning that at lower temperatures, more heat is required for vaporization. During the vaporization of an anesthetic agent, the necessary heat is drawn from the remaining liquid agent and its surroundings. As vapor forms and heat energy is lost, the temperatures of both the vaporizer and the liquid agent decrease. 
this temperature drop causes the vapor pressure of the anesthetic to decrease. Without any compensatory mechanism, this decrease in vapor pressure would lead to a reduced output of vapor. Modern anesthetic vaporizers ensure consistent anesthetic delivery by managing temperature changes effectively. They use external heat sources like electric heaters and heat exchangers to maintain stable temperatures. High thermal conductivity materials such as aluminum and copper distribute heat efficiently. Advanced thermostatic control systems with sensors and automatic adjustments keep the liquid anesthetic at a constant temperature. We will discuss all of this when we look into the design of the vaporizer. Specific heat refers to the number of calories required to increase the temperature of 1 gram of a substance by 1 degree Celsius. In simpler terms, specific heat is a measure of how resistant a substance is to heating up. A substance with a high specific heat takes more energy to get warmer, while a substance with a low specific heat heats up quickly with less energy. For example, Water has a high specific heat, which means it takes a lot of energy to raise its temperature. This is why water heats up and cools down slowly compared to many other substances. When liquid anesthetic evaporates, the latent heat of vaporization causes the remaining liquid's temperature to drop. To counter this, Heat must be continuously supplied to keep the temperature stable and ensure consistent vaporization. Materials with a high specific heat such as copper, require more heat to change their temperature just like water. Therefore, for the same amount of heat lost during vaporization, temperature changes in these materials are more gradual. This property is advantageous because it slows down temperature fluctuations ensuring that the anesthetic liquid remains at an optimal temperature for vaporization. Thermal conductivity measures how well a material allows heat to flow through it. Vaporizers are designed using materials with high thermal conductivity like copper and aluminum to facilitate efficient heat transfer, quickly distributing heat throughout the vaporizer. This efficiency helps to counteract any cooling effects from the vaporization process.